So today we will talk about olfaction. Olfaction is one of the greatest important sensory modality because smell of pizza could make you happy or smell of rose might make you feel satiated or loved and also smell of smell from a garbage tin can make you angry. So olfaction is one of the most interesting sensory modality. Out of many aspect of olfaction in this video I would talk about anatomy of the olfactory system and also the detailed signaling mechanism underlying olfaction and also I would discuss how olfactory information is decoded by our brain and the possible mechanism about it and also drawing parallels from the current research and at the end I would talk about olfactory adaptation how our olfactory system is adapted to a fluctuating odor environment in order to maximize its dynamic range of detection. So if you haven't subscribed to my channel, quickly subscribe and don't forget to hit that like button. So let's start. So olfaction starts from the nose where odor molecules mixed up with air come inside our nose and our olfactory epithelia is a moist epithelia Inside the olfactory epithelia, there are several sensory neurons known as olfactory sensory neurons. When the odor molecules come to the olfactory sensory neurons, they excite the olfactory sensory neurons and the information is transferred to the next level in the brain. That is from the olfactory bulb to the higher level of the brain. Now, here is a diagram which depicts the olfactory sensory neurons. Olfactory sensory neurons are the peripheral most sensory layer. So these olfactory sensory neurons have a single dendritic projection, a dendritic knob from there a lot of cilia like projection appears. Now onto the cilia of these olfactory receptor neurons, if you see in the details that there would be specific olfactory receptors. Now olfactory receptors are working like a sensor to detect the odor from the environment. Now olfactory receptors are mostly found in a complex of an olfactory receptor and a co-receptor. Now mostly this kind of configuration is true for mouse, flies and also in humans. So olfactory receptors are mostly 7 transmembrane G protein coupled receptor and they are actually classical GS or G stimulatory G protein signaling paradigm. So olfactory receptor binds to heterotrimeric G protein. Once the odor molecule here the green dot binds to the olfactory receptor the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein dissociates and activates the adenylate cyclase to generate cyclic AMP from ATP. Now on the olfactory receptor neuron there are several cyclic nucleotide gated channels. Cyclic nucleotide gated channels opens when cyclic nucleotide such as cyclic AMP is there. So increase in cyclic AMP levels would allow the cyclic nucleotide gated channel to open and allow the influx of calcium and sodium etc positive cations from inside. Another individual school of thought also suggests the olfactory receptor and the co-receptor could individually work like an ion channel allowing positive cations to enter the cell. However, when cations enter the cell from outside, it would depolarize the membrane. So the dendritic membrane is depolarized and that gives rise to a change in potential. So this is a graded potential. So that the earliest phase of the olfactory transduction is the change in membrane potential and this is called a transduction current. Now at the end of the cell body at the axon initiation segment this transduction would be integrated to form a spike. So there is a spike transduction to spike transformation and which could be beautifully mathematically modeled by bilobed filters and also the information in the next part in the axon would be propagated in form of action potentials 
at the end when the action potential reaches at the end of the ORN terminal or the olfactory receptor neuron terminal, it would be going towards the second level, which is a projection neuron. In case of human, the projection neurons are tufted cell and mitral cells. And there are also local interneurons that gives GABAergic inhibition to this synapse. And we would look at in a moment that how this GABAergic inhibition could be very important for olfactory signal processing. Now, from the projection neuron, that means the mitral cell or the tufted cell, the information is projected to the higher brain center. For example, the olfactory cortex is mostly, the most important part of the olfactory cortex is the piriform cortex. Also some part of entorenal cortex, some perineal cortex, and some part of amygdala is also important for higher olfactory processing. Now one interesting question is to be answered, which is how the information about odor intensity and the quality is kind of decoded. And we can decode it in our real life. So definitely it turns out the answer lies in the firing rate of these olfactory receptor neurons. So the firing rate and the firing pattern in time is very important and maybe those features are decoded by our brain to gain the information about intensity and quality and also assign a valence to an odor whether it's attractive or aversive or irritating like that. So John Carlson's lab, lab in Yale used Drosophila as a model system to understand that how olfactory distinction or how, how the discrimination between two odors or how the intensity is determined by the olfactory system. So fly olfactory system, just like a mammalian olfactory system, is very similar. There are also olfactory cilia all around the dendrites of the, uh, of the olfactory sensory neurons. And the odor molecule you can see here in red would bind to specific olfactory receptors. Now, why they use Drosophila olfactory system? Because Drosophila olfactory system has striking similarity with the olfactory system of a mouse or olfactory system of a human. So the basic architecture is pretty similar. Also, they have olfactory receptor neuron, the first layer, and the second layer is the projection neuron, which is very similar to mitral or the tufted cells. And also they have local interneurons. Local interneurons, ORN and PN synapses form a glomerulus, a cluster of synapses. And an interesting aspect of olfactory processing happens in the glomerulus. So stay tuned and I will describe that. Now, what they have found is very striking. They have found if they give several orders to the fly and record from the fly's olfactory receptor neuron, they can get a spike rate, the data in format of spikes per second. They saw that if they arrange this spiking dynamics in a three-dimensional Euclidean space for three different orders. So what would happen is if the orders are quite similar in nature or they smell similar, then they are quite close in a Euclidean space. While a order which is very different would be quite far apart from the Euclidean space. So constructing a Euclidean space can give us an understanding that which orders are similar, how, how a fly or how an organism perceive two orders as a similar order or two orders as a very distinct order. So the distance, Euclidean distance is very important for this discrimination. So this is also known as the dis distance discrimination model. And I uh, suggest you to read this paper by Helen and Carlson in uh, 2006 cell and the link is given in the description. These researchers also found that with the increase of dilution of several orders, the discriminability between orders becomes poor and poor. For example, if there are 10 different orders in the environment at very high concentration, we might think, okay, this is the beautiful order of rose, that's a garbage smell and everything all like this. But when there are same orders present in the environment, but have very dilution. So everything is turns out to be a mixed out something unpleasant or some, something like that. But we cannot distinguishly tell that this order is coming from that source and that order is coming from that source. 
So this might be a clue for that. So what happens at lower concentration, firing rate is also low. So in that situation, the Euclidean distance between these several components are very low. So that explains how discriminability goes low in lower concentration of order. Now, every day, our olfactory system poses a striking challenge. If you walk for 100 meters, you would get exposed to several odors. For example, car smoke, food odors, some odor from garbage, somebody smoking, etc. and etc. But your olfactory system has to code for a sensory modality properly without getting, without getting uh, confused from these fluctuations in the odor environment. And this task is severely, severely difficult because think about it, our olfactory system has to detect as low concentration as few molecules in the environment and also cannot get saturation, saturated at very high concentration of odor in an environment. In other words, it has to maximize its dynamic range depending upon the external situation. And it has to change the dynamic range in real time in order for proper detection of odor. Now, that's why olfactory adaptation would rescale our uh, olfactory sensations and thereby help us to detect optimally. For example, when you enter a room from outside, you would find there is a characteristic smell in the room. But after staying for 10 to 20 minutes in the room, you would find you would find there is nothing different like you would kind of getting habituated with the environment of the room. In other words, your nervous system, your olfactory system is getting adapted. It, it is getting rescaled. It is changing its output. So adaptation is present in several different sensory modalities. For example, vision, somatosensory cortex and any other modalities. So olfactory adaptation help to modify the perception towards the smell. Now, how does olfactory adaptation works? Olfactory adaptation could work at different time scales, at different cellular and molecular changes could occur. For example, at very early time point, for few seconds to few minutes, olfactory adaptation could occur by changing the transduction currents. And the transduction current could be changed by the change in the phosphorylation status of these cyclic nucleotide gated channel. A little bit more time point, that is a few minutes to few second order, there could be internalization of the olfactory receptor itself. That can alter the conductivity of the olfactory sensory neurons. In order of few minutes to few hours, there could be change in, in action potential dynamics because the, the level of the ion channels that governs the, of, uh, the that governs the action potential dynamics could also change in expression now at few minutes to several hours or several days there could be change in the transcript level transcription of the let's say the olfactory receptors the channels etc and etc and also several hours to several days another important change and feedback mechanisms could occur at the synaptic level so we would look at little bit about the molecular changes and also the synaptic component to it. So as we have earlier discussed the olfactory signal transduction pathway, it has been seen when there is too much odor in the environment and there is a lot of calcium and sodium influx from the cyclic nucleotide gated channel and too much calcium gives a feedback signaling via calcium binding protein which in turn reduce the sensitivity of the cyclic nucleotide gated channel. In simple words, it closes the cyclic nucleotide gated channel, allowing further influx of calcium and sodium inside the system. Also, CAMK2, which is activated by elevated calcium, can give a feedback to adenylate cyclase, telling it to produce less cyclic AMP. This is how the gain or the regulator of the olfactory transduction could be regulated by the mechanism of adaptation. At the synaptic level, it could be occur in a beautiful way. So let's say we have in the olfactory system, we have a, a coding scheme. Let's say we have a few five to six molecules that give rise to a five to six spikes in the olfactory 
uh, sensory neuron for for a initial time one. Now, as the concentration increases for several 10 to 20 molecules, the spiking rate also increases. But think about a time when there would be a thousand of or billions of olfactory molecules in the environment. Then what would happen to the olfactory uh, spiking? The neuron would spike and reach the saturation. But it's not good for the neuron because it cannot maintain its broad dynamic range. So it, if it saturates early, at that situation, it is might not be able to detect a very low concentration in the environment. So in a normal situation, here is the olfactory recept olfaction curve. For example, with increase in co concentration, the firing rate of this olfactory receptor neuron would increase. But if it is too much odor molecules in the environment and there is no adaptation mechanism present, that it would saturate early, way early. But adaptation mechanism help to stretch the curve towards the right hand side. That means it make it difficult for the neuron to saturate even if there is a lot of odor molecule in the environment. And let me explain how. So when there is too much odor molecule in the environment, odor give rise to a uh, uh, lot of acetylcholine release in the ORN and projection neuron synapses. And acetylcholine would allow depolarization in the postsynaptic neuron. But when there is too much activation or too much odors in the environment, the local interneurons secrete GABA. Here is a red dot and GABA allows chloride influx inside the ORN terminal. And that chloride influx in turn suppress or in turn interferes with the uh, vesicle release process in the ORN terminal. That means even if there is a lot of stimulus present in the environment, the release from the ORN terminal is sort of regulated by an inhibitory feedback from the local interneuron. Here, hereby we can understand that, that a negative feedback regulation is present in the olfactory circuit and it's not true for only olfactory circuit. This kind of negative feedback mechanisms is present in many sensory modalities and these, these feedback mechanisms help, help to uh, maintain the broad dynamic range of detection of a sensory modality. So this mechanism is also known as synaptic gain control mechanism. So by this mechanism of the olfactory tuning curve could be stretched towards right and it would be harder for the neuron to get to saturation. In other words, the dynamic range is now increased. So that is kind of a conclusion of my video. If you like my video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you.